Yeah, I'm going to do a, um, a musings coming up pretty soon on tasting vocabulary, tasting the tasting experience. I realized I was doing a a tasting on I was doing a vertical tasting on the reckless red, and I was using all these terms. And I'm, uh, you know, I I am as hyperbolic as the next person. And I was using terms that were coming to me as I was tasting. And I was, and I sat back after I watched this a couple of times and I'm like, well, how did I know what to say? And I think this is going to be interesting because I want to talk through the experience and what are the things you need to know when you go into a tasting and you don't want to feel intimidated. It's easy to feel intimidated, especially if you're we get it all the time, right? Oh, you're a winemaker. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, I don't have a refined palate. Well, I got to tell you, I don't have a refined palate. I have a macro palate. Well, what does that mean? Well, a macro, and I'm not going to go into it here. I'm going to come back with some better definitions. So this is just a rambling. So, but where does the language come from? What are the descriptors? And the other part of the equation for me is what kind of taster are you? Are you a visual taster? Are you an auditory taster? I know that's a weird thing to say. So as a visual taster, are you a relator? Mm -hmm. And I'm making these terms up right now, by the way. So I'm, these are just things that as I observe people tasting that I think, oh, that person's a visual taster. I'm a visual taster. I see... I see the flavors as shapes. I feel the acidity go through this way or this way. I feel the depth doing this. I'm a, I'm a uh, auditory taster. Ah, um, I, I, I taste this and I, and I remember being on the beach with birds and and there's this hint of. Of, uh, of C and, right? That's an auditory taster. Then there's a simile taster or a, a relatable, related taste. You know, somebody who goes, this tastes like this. Which one are you? Are, you know, and, and you could think of all the different learning styles, if you will, kin kin kinesthetic, auditory, visual, whatever. You can think through that. Um, in, in this, it's, it can, and there are people out there that when they taste something, they understand it. Now, here's the thing. I also am a smell taster. What is that? Well, a smell taster is somebody... So, so the only sense in, is, that does not go through higher order parts of the brain is the sense of smell. It goes straight to the lizard brain or straight to the amygdala, right? And so the smells can often trigger the most direct memories possible. And everybody's got... So, people with a sense of smell, so I'm going to qualify because I've talked to people who don't have senses of smell, they often have very direct responses to the way things smell. And there are wines that I can smell now, and I can go right back to when I tasted the first time. And, and then you relate to them, right? So there's this the spectrum of of, of um, how much left and right. So a Cabernet, right? A Cabernet has a spectrum of smell. And most Cabernets, you know, have the eu eucalyptus and cur uh, currant, things like that. And, you know, this deep, dark red fruits or, or black fruits. You can, you can go, ah, I see that. I smell that. And that goes right into how your whole thought process. So how does that work? So once you understand that, so are you a micro palate? Are you a macro palate? Um, then it's what kind of taster are you? What are, what are your, what are your relatable experiences and clues, right? So how do you relate to this wine? Is it auditory? Is it visual? Is it kinesthetic? Is it sense of smell, right? No, sense of smell is probably in there by default. So then it becomes language. 
right? And there's a common set of vocabulary. You see it on the tasting wheel. Here's all the fruit. Here's all the, the you know, cigar and black tar and concrete. And so you see the, the, the whole tasting wheel and you, you've got all those flavors on there. But that's, it's like a color palette, right? A color palette, you can have 16 colors on your, you remember the old computers with 16 colors and things weren't, uh, you know, not a lot of separation. And then you got to 32 and 64 and then one point or 16.4 million, right? And now it's, you know, I don't know how many. That's not even a grade anymore. At one point, it was such a big deal because it was the number of of um, how much memory was in the graphics card and all this other kind of stuff. And the color depth was, was the combination. Well, now there's the vocabulary depth. And when you look at a color wheel, of course, immediately what comes to mind for me is a, uh, sorry, a tasting wheel. It's a color wheel, right? Even, <laughs> even I even uh, messed the two up. And as a result of that, where is the separation? So if it's got concrete, is it wet concrete? Is it dry concrete? Is it just poured concrete? Is it concrete with granite? Is it concrete with gravel? Right? So you can get to this really fine and your vocabulary becomes the way you express this. I talk about some of my favorite Cab Francs in my entire life have been ones that remind me of this is a crazy thing to talk about. Cat's paws on hot concrete, right? Along with wet cement that has been um, just recently rained on. There's these, two, these amazing sensual flavors that show up. And it's so, like, you know, you, you hear uh, rain on a tin roof, right? That is a term and if you've ever heard it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Same thing with you go outside and you smell concrete that's just been rained on. And it's got this fresh vitality to it. And it's just all these ions and all these. And JT will tell you in a heartbeat what that, what that chemical compound is. And I think that's fantastic. And it, it does not take away from the sensual pleasure of of hot concrete just being rained on. Um, dirt. Dirt, there's so many kinds of dirt. There's, there's slightly wet dirt that has a slightly muddy feel with a little cake to it. There's dry dust, right? And dust from a particular part of the country, in a particular part of Napa, or, you know, the dry creek dust. That's a term they talk about. It's just, that's the, describes the tannins. And when you know it, you know it. Same thing with like American oak and French oak barrels. So when you, you, when you actually understand the difference between what a French oak brings to a wine and what a, an, uh, an American oak brings to a wine, you immediately and almost forevermore can say which one is which. And in some cases, it's, it's, in some cases, the American oak really enhances the flavors. In some cases, it causes it to turn and taste like pickle. Who wants to taste a pickle wine? Not me. And I know, and I have a visceral reaction to it. Rarely have I had a French oak that takes a wine in a bad direction. I've had several American oaks that have taken wine in a, in a wrong direction. And it's just, it, maybe it's my palate, maybe it's my own um, biases. I, I don't know, but that's the case. It's just been one of those things. So, but That's the whole tasting experience. It's like, having enough confidence to say what you're feeling about this wine. So what is this? Okay, so this is a, <laughs> you're going to laugh at this. This is a Pinot. We don't make a Pinot, and I've talked more about Pinot than probably any other grape on these things so far, right? It's, it's only been a year and a little bit. So um, anyway, this is a Pinot. It is from, uh, let's see, this is from Napa. No, it's not from Napa. It's from Paso Robles. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's from the Central Coast. It's not from Paso Robles. Uh, it's too hot for that. Um, and it's got this cola flavor to it. So it's, it's, it has um, sassafras is a term that's used to describe some of the base 
cola flavors, and, you know, very old cola, um, or let me say that differently, cola from an age ago, not old as in this hasn't been opened for 10 years, I'm opening it and that's what it tastes like. No, it's cola from when I was two or three or four or five, I had these flavors. I went to Sonic. I go to Sonic with my mom, she'd buy us a particular type of drink, that's what I get out of this. You know, the slushy, or the, actually not the slushy, it was with a particular kind of ice, shaved ice. And this is, at the end of that, this was it. Kind of a little bit sweet, but it's got this strong cola flavors, almost like syrupy cola flavors. Not sweet, though. Anyway. Mm. Then there's almost a fire. Um, smoky flavor to it. No, but it's not one of the wines that was, was impacted by wildfires. So I don't know where that's coming from. It's probably just Pinot because Pinot is so so varied. There's so many different things with Pinot. It's probably got that to it. But I get this red, I get red fruit out of it. I, I get boysenberry or raspberry out of this. Uh, not a lot of cherry. Uh, well, maybe maraschino cherry. And I keep saying it's not sweet, but maraschino cherry's got a very particular flavor before it becomes kind of a sweet maraschino cherry. Or, if, nah, for that, <laughs> for that, um, that Sonic drink as a youth, that was one of the things that came in at the end was the maraschino cherry. And that was right dug way down at the bottom and I had to finish it all and then I could, and it was cold and it was, oh, make my teeth like gummy yummy. Boy, that's some memories. So these are the kinds of descriptors you can use. I could also talk about how it's hitting my mouth and the shape of it in my mouth. So let's talk that. So I don't get a lot of high acid or brightness. Okay, brightness is a better term to use than acid. So, so uh, Barbera tends to go like right here and right to the middle of the brain. This has brightness, but it goes this way. So it's got a more, it's got a more structured mouthfeel. And because it's filling up the entire mouth, it's giving some back, getting some, some tannins back here, a little dryness in the, in the base of the mouth. So these are all very uh, visual descriptors about what's happening to you, touch, if you will. Yeah. Now, other visual descriptors are, I, I see this on an autumn day. So in the fall, kind of like what it is now. I see this at not quite twilight. I see this in the early evening, sun still up, slight breeze, two or three people hanging out and we're enjoying this. A dog, if you have a dog, we don't, we have cats, but there's, I could see a dog involved. I could see cheese and some bread and an appetizer or two. And it, the, the evening is full of possibilities. So at that point, you could go dancing, have dinner, you could all agree, it's been a long day, we're gonna wrap up, we're gonna go home. But it is all potential at that point. And that is what I get out of that sip. Tasting wine is, it, it can be intimidating. I wanna acknowledge that. I want those of you who watch this and are very experienced in this are kinda of going, you know, hit the fast forward button because you're like, yeah, whatever. There's a lot of people out there that enjoy wine, but feel you know, when they go into an experience where they're hanging out with three or four winemakers, right? You come to a Reckless Blenders event, you're hanging out with three or four winemakers. Hey, it's like, oh, I don't have the words to describe this. I don't want to, I'm, I'm going to hold that back because I'm going to say the wrong thing. Totally understand that. Totally understand that. It took me 10 years to get to a point where I, I'm like, yeah, I'm comfortable in what and how I approach wine and what I think of it. Um, but most of the time I'll find find goodness out of stuff. You know, like last night I was having some of this and I thought it's just, it's like tar, right? 
and it had that tar feeling. Now, it could have been what I had for uh, dinner. It could have just been my attitude. It could have been a lot of different things. But I said, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. Instead of getting rid of it, instead of saying, oh, it's not to my liking, I'm going to put a cork in it. I'm going to split it out so I can save it and I can be good about it. And I'm going to put it to the side. And I, and I thought tonight, right before I started recording this, I thought, well, let me just try it and see. Well, and frankly, it was the only thing that had a decent split up there that <laughs> in my in my collection that I didn't want to like open a new bottle for. So I, I pulled it out and I t- took a taste. I'm like, oh my gosh, this has got all these characters to it, all these characteristics and all these interesting flavors and a little bit of not cinnamon, cedar, a little bit of cedar. And cedar tends to be oak influence. But this is not like oak influence in a negative way. This is um, this is like the where it was grown, where what was around it. I get trees, certain particular trees. I get all these like wild characteristics to to this wine. My advice is understand what you like. That's the number one thing, right? So understand all this about yourself. And and, and I'll talk about in, in future musings, I'll talk about how do you figure out, are you a micro palate? Are you a macro palate? How do you come up with your wine language? Um, how do you know if you're a, a visual, kinesthetic, touch, hearing, whatever, whatever sense you are and the kind of wine taster you are? We'll talk about that as we go along. But for now, you know, know that you can walk in and the first thing is, do you like it or do you not? The second thing is, why do you like it or why do you not like it? And that's the most challenging aspect of this. And and there's a whole bunch of stuff about, you know, the amount of sh- of, of alcohol and, and, and sugar, you know, the, the alcohol, sugar balance, the acidity, um, all of that shows up in, in here. And, you know, that's why some of the big brassy, bold, uh, Cabernets win all the awards because wine tasters, wine judges, you know, they're tasting two or three things and there's no context to the wine. There's no history. Uh, it's all, you know, how do you feel about this and big and bold and punchy. That's what's going to win because that's the thing you remember. Whereas, if it's with food and if it's got a history that you understand, I mean, Reckless Blenders has great history. It enhances the wine. The wine's fantastic already. But when you understand, you know, you're hanging out with the winemakers and you're talking to us about how we got here and what our decisions were and, you know, you're watching these and that kind of stuff, it all becomes part of the entanglement. And this is the, the you know, in France and Italy and other, you know, Europe, you've got these these regions that are not like Napa is a region. It's more like this is a, around a town and you've got the town or the province vineyards and the vineyards all come together and they make a white and they make a red and it depends on, you know, the grapes and the time of year, but it's really all about what is grown and how it comes together. And it's all about the shared experience. And that's just a wonderful thing when you when you think about it you're all as a town you're getting together and you're helping stomp and blah and then you know i'm not going to talk about the modernization of that kind of stuff but that is the history of european wines in in, in america it's been a little less it, it's not as communal there's community to it right you, you've most of you have participated with us either in bottling or crushing or coming into the reckless wine days or whatever, you've seen some of the activity. You've gone into the into the cave, if you will. You've seen it. You've tasted it from barrels. That's part of it. Um, and so I love that as a way to build community. And I don't know how I got here, but boy, howdy, was it a fun trip. <laughs> With that, I'm Rocket. This has been Amusings from Rocket Cellar. Thank you.